students. For today's lecture, we're going to be discussing voters and elections. We're going to start off with something called the participation paradox. The participation paradox states that individual votes rarely have any effect on the outcome of an election. Think about it. How many elections do you see that the end results are decided by a handful of elections? You know, two, three, four. Unless it's some of the smaller cities, smaller towns, very little voter turnout, this doesn't happen. It is very rare to see these very close elections, these very close vote counts. If this is the case, if we know that you know, if they don't win, if we vote, they're going to win by you know, 15,628. Well, if we don't vote, they're going to win by 15,627. So if we know this, why do we vote? There's various thought process, processes out there. There's various theories. And we're not talking about that, you know, people feel it's their civic duty. No, that's, that's not what I'm discussing here. There's two thought processes that I like. The first one is actually an economic theory by Thomas Downs. Downs creates something called, or he comes up with this idea called a cost-benefit analysis. Now, we do cost-benefit analysis on a daily basis. We just don't know what it's called. We don't realize we're doing it. The cost-benefit analysis is simply we can only perform one action at a time. So, if we have two actions that we would like to perform, but we could only perform one, we realize that we are giving up the benefit from that other action, or, or we are giving up whatever we would gain from that second action. So, we have to decide which action we prefer, which action's the most important to us, brings the most enjoyment, however you want to look at it. You have an example. You have two dollars, you're at school, you're hungry and you're thirsty. You go to the vending machines. Bottled Coke cost a dollar seventy five Snickers bar cost a dollar fifty. Remember, you have two dollars, and you only have two dollars. This means you can only afford one of the two items. So you must do a cost-benefit analysis. Are you more hungry than thirsty? If so, you're going to get the Snickers bar at the expense of giving up the drink, giving up the Coke. If you're more thirsty than hungry, you're going to get the Coke but it's at the expense of the Snickers bar. This is a cost-benefit analysis. If we have a choice between going to vote and doing something else, going home and watching something on TV, we're going to decide which action is the most important to us, which one is going to bring us the most joy. If we decide that voting is the most important to us, if voting is the thing we should do, we're going to go vote at the cost of missing what everyone to see on TV. But if whatever's on TV is more important to us, we're going to do that and not vote. So cost-benefit analysis. The second idea or reason that says we vote is something called the life cycle the life cycle. It deals with age. Simply put, the older we get, the more government interacts with our life. The more important we realize government is, the bigger influence it has on us. You're in your 20s. You're in your late teens, early 20s. 
government may affect you directly by providing student loans. Late 20s, government's going to affect you. Hopefully you're out of college, you successfully finished. But now you're, you're worried about the government's economic policy. Is this going to create jobs? Is this going to make borrowing money to purchase a home or purchase a car easier? What's it going to do with the interest rate? 30s, you're still working. You're still worried about your job. You're still paying off your house. You're still purchasing cars. But now you have children. So now you're worried about their education. So you're still worried about the government's education policy. 40s, still working. By now, your home may, may be paid off, but you might be looking at a second home. You might be looking to move to a bigger home. Your kids are still in school, going to high school, going to college. On the horizon, way out there, but coming, retirement. So you're worried about Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, whatever it is. Get to your 50s, retirement's a whole lot closer. Now the kids are gone. You might be downsizing. You might be selling your home to buy a, a smaller home. But like, you're still working, still concerned about health care. 60s. And retirement staring you in the face. Government policies about retirement, Social Security, your IRA, whatever it is that's affecting you. Do you care about education? I mean, you're done, your children are done. Well, your children went off and did something silly like get married. And they provided you with grandchildren. Are you worried about your grandchildren's education? Are you worried about the economic policies that they're going to face? <coughs> Dang, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Couldn't hit pause fast enough. Yeah, you are still worried about that. So this life cycle is the idea that the older we get, the more impact government has on our life. So this is going to encourage us to vote. The practice of voting. Basically, this is going to discuss a few seconds who votes. We can look at people and, and estimate, predict if they're going to vote or not. The most important demographic variables in regards to voting are education, income, and age. So what this means is people are more likely to vote if they have more education. They're able to sit here and look at the information presented, look at the ideas presented by government, and decide for themselves. Does this benefit me or not? Does this proposed law or what this person stands for benefits me or not? So more education, more likely to vote. More income. We talked about this under parties when we talked about the Republican takeover. If we have more income, we want to preferably get richer. We at least want to maintain our wealth. We don't want to lose. But we're going to vote with the hopes of we're voting for people who are going to get us richer. Older individuals. Life cycle. Just went through it. One I didn't discuss before, but it does exist. Strong interest in politics or identification with a major party. Well, actually, we did talk about this about under political parties that this voter identification is going to make us. It's going to want to, We're going. It's going to encourage us to vote and go out and vote for our party. We want our party to do well.
Easy. This section's easy. In Texas, who can vote? Running for office is easy. Voting is easy. Have to be a citizen of the United States at least 18 years of age and you must be a resident of Texas. Guys, this is all it takes. If you can meet these three criteria, you're eligible to vote in, tex in, in the elections that Texas holds. Now, this is who can vote. We do see that there's a couple of instances where individuals are prohibited. Individuals are not allowed to vote. Those who aren't allowed to vote. If you have been declared mentally incompetent in formal court proceedings, if you have gone before a formal mental health court and they said that you were ineligible of making good decisions, you lose your right to vote. If you're convicted of a felony, you temporarily, and this is temporarily, lose your right to vote. You lose it if you have not been pardoned. When, if the governor pardons you, your rights are restored right then, right there. But what do we know about Texas and the governor and clemency? It's not going to happen. So this one's technically a way to restore your voting right. It's never going to happen. So if you're convicted of a felony, you need to be worried about the second one or you need to be informed of the second one that after two calendar years from the completion of your sentence this is when your right to vote is returned this is when your right to vote is restored In order to vote, a person must be registered. How to register to vote? How? Really, really easy, once again. You can register in person or by mail at any time of the year. Go online, Secretary of State's office, try to figure, look to see how to register to vote. You fill out this little form, you mail it to them. It takes about three minutes. It is not difficult to register to vote. Now, the catch with Texas. If you want to vote in an election in Texas, you must be registered to vote 30 days or more before that election takes place. You must be registered to vote 30 days or more before that election takes place. We allow you to vote while renewing a driver's license. You can go down to DPS when you're renewing your, your driver's license. They'll ask you, are you registered to vote? If you say no, they'll say, would you like to be? We will register you here. Is voting high in Texas? is voter turnout high and we're going to talk about this a couple of times and the answer is unfortunately no it's not well what we see is the state has made an effort to increase voter turnout they did this by creating early voting In 1991 the legislature authorized early voting what this is is that two weeks before election day certain polling places are open there's a reduced number of voting areas they have reduced hours but they are open seven days a week so they're open on weekends so you can go to any of these polling places and vote early the intent was to increase voter turnout 
Did it work? Yes, it did. So we can do that. Keep in mind, early voting is an option. I said voter turnout in the United States, voter turnout in Texas. Two terms I want you to know, and I want you to understand the difference. Voter turnout is the proportion of eligible Americans who vote. So this means that voter turnout, if we're talking about American politics and American elections, national elections, if we're talking about Texas state elections, let's go with Texas state elections, <coughs> voter turnout is the number of people the eligible Americans, or eligible Texans, who vote. So they're 18 or older, they're registered to vote, they're a citizen, they're a resident, they're not felons, all that stuff. That is voter turnout. Another phrase we use, and this one is not as accurate. I don't like this one, but a lot of people use it. Voting age population. Voting age population has grown at a much faster rate than the actual voting population. Well, voting age population is what? Simply anybody over the age of 18. So what's the difference? And why is it such a big deal? Well, voting age population, just because they're over 18, does that mean that they're actually eligible to vote? No, it doesn't. They might be felons. They might have been declared mentally incompetent. They might not be citizens of the United States. They might not be residents of Texas. For whatever reason, they can't vote. So we may have 5, 5, excuse me, 500,000 people in the voting age population. We may have 500,000 people in Texas that are age 18 and over. If 100,000 Texans voted, well, we'd say 20%, 100,000 out of the 500,000, one out of five, of the voting age population voted. This is true. Can we get more accurate? Well, say that out of that 500,000, only 400,000 of the 500,000 are actually eligible to vote. The other 100,000 mentally incompetent. They're felons. They're not residents of the state. They're not citizens of the United States. Whatever. So actually only 400,000 of, of the 500,000 500, were eligible to vote. Well, if 100,000 out of the 400,000 voted, now we're at 25% of eligible voters participated. Eligible voters voted. So we see the accuracy here in this statement is greater. So understand what they're reporting, whether it's voter turnout or voting age population. And I'm going to show you something in a few minutes. that I'm, The pictures, the graphs actually use voting age population but it's still a decent graph to get a point across. Okay, in a nutshell, voter turnout in the United States, voter turnout in Texas is extremely low. That, it, that simple. We don't vote. Why not? Well, there's two main reasons that we see that there's a drop-off of voter turnout in the United States. We can further this on to Texas. The first one is something called the 26th Amendment. Passed in 1972, the 26th Amendment lowered the voting age from 21 to 18. Well, we increased the number of people who could vote. Why would this decrease voter turnout? What do we know about young people? Young people don't vote. So we made more young people eligible to vote 
but that doesn't mean that they are taking advantage of the situation. Just because we made them eligible to vote doesn't mean that they actually are. So yes, we lowered the voting age, but young people aren't voting. So that decreased the number. The second reason that we see this decrease is simply there's a drop in identification with the two major political parties. We are not strongly identifying as Republican. We are not strongly identifying as Democrat. So we have no real urge to go out and vote. We have no urge to we have no urge to participate. So we don't want to see our team do well. We don't want to see our party win. We, well, we do, but with a lack of major political parties, we don't. We don't participate, so we don't vote. And we know this because now when we poll Texans, when we poll Americans, and remember I showed you this number in a different chapter. Currently, one-third of all Americans now consider themselves to be independents. They do not consider themselves to be Republicans. They do not consider themselves to be Democrats. So there is no overwhelming party loyalty to convince them to go out and vote, to convince them to go out and participate. Voter turnout around the world. Let's look at how the United States ranks, or how we do. And notice at the bottom of the page, it is using a voting age population. I don't like this, but this is what I have. If you look at these countries, where does it, I used to ask who ranks higher? What percent of countries or which countries have a higher percentage of voter turnout than the United States? Looking at this, it is much easier for me to ask who ranks below the United States in voting age population turnout? The United States, we're at 56.9, Mexico, 48.1%, Russia, 55%. Switzerland, 50%. Three countries rank worse than us in voter turnout of voting age population. I'm going to repeat this again. Voter turnout in Texas, voter turnout in the United States is extremely low. This one, we're going to look at voter turnout by elections. Table 3.1 and once again this is voting age population but this works. Percentage of the voting age population casting ballots in presidential general elections from 1960 to 2008. So presidential general elections these are our November elections where we are electing the President of the United States. Now, man, these are big, glitzy, glamorous elections. A lot of money spent, a lot of television. We see names all over the place. So, let's look at this. 1960. 62.8% of the voting age population of the United States voted for president. In Texas, 41.8%. Difference, 21%. Texas, we ranked 44th out of 50 states. 1964, for the United States, it drops off a little bit, 61.9%. For Texas, it goes up a little bit. 44.4% of voting age population Texans voted. Different 17.5, but we still ranked 48th out of 50. Look at 2000. Look at 2004. These are the ones that get me. 
2,051.3% of the United States, 43.1% of Texas, we were 48th out of 50. 2004, 55.4% of Texans, or excuse me, of the United States, 45.5% of Texas, about a 10% difference, 9.9. Yet we ranked 49th out of 50 states. I bring these two up. Why? Can you think of who was running for president in 2000 and in 2004? That In 2000, that was when Texas Governor George Bush was trying to become U.S. President George Bush. Our sitting governor was running for, for president, and yet only 43% of the voting age population in Texas made it out to the poll. He's running for re-election in 2004, and only 45.5% of, of the voting age population in Texas got out to, to vote. 3.2. Let's look at table 3.2. Percentage of the voting age population casting ballots in non-presidential general elections. <coughs> These are our elections. We have federal elections every two years. So you see we had the presidential elections 1960, 64, 68, 72, etc. These non-presidential elections 1962, 66. We call them midterm elections. Why do we call them midterm elections? Because they are in the middle of the president's term, hence midterm elections. Are midterm elections important to us as Texans? I mean, we're not electing the president, so they're not big, they're not glamorous, but they should be more important to us than the presidential elections. Why? It's simple. During these midterm elections, this is when we are electing our state officers. This is when we are electing our executive branch. Governor, Lieutenant Governor, Attorney General, Controller, those people. So the midterm elections actually have a larger impact on our life. They have a more significant impact on our life than the federal government, or the federal elections, the, the presidential elections, there we go, than the presidential elections do. So we really should be voting in these midterm elections, do we? Looking at these numbers, we see that, well, the United States, we don't vote in Texas. We're even worse than the average person in the United States. 1962 midterm election, 45.4% of the United States voted. Voting age population participated. Texas, 25.8%. We ranked 43rd. 1970, the national level, 43.5% of the United States voting age population cast ballots in Texas. Well, we did 27.5%, but we are 18.4%. I'm sorry, I was looking at the one before it. We ranked 49th. Now, 1998, there is a typo here. 1998, United States, 36.4%. For Texas, that should be 26.1% difference of 10.3 percent we ranked 47th out of 50. 2006 hey we did good we actually made it all the way to the bottom 2006 and 66. so does people in the united states vote no do people in texas vote does the voter turnout very high the answer is unfortunately no it's not Reasons. There are other, there are considerations as to why the numbers in Texas are low. From a historical standpoint, this historical limitations, we had a poll tax. The early 1900s, we had a poll tax. You had to pay to vote. Well, unfortunately, 
this disenfranchised minorities, this disenfranchised poor Anglo Texans, and the poll tax was only like a buck fifty, a dollar, a dollar fifty a year, but a lot of people couldn't afford to pay this, so the poll tax hurt our voter turnout throughout our history. Woman suffrage. Ladies, y'all didn't get the right to vote till 1920. So, I don't know what else to say there. What's called the white primary. This begins in 1903, where Texas government, the Democrats, go out of their way to disenfranchise African American voters. We start seeing the court cases in the 19 teens, 1920. Once again, we talked about Grovey v. Herndon, Nixon v. Townsend, those kind of things. But the white primary, we prevented African Americans from voting in the Democratic primary. We would not allow a certain segment of the population to vote. Military vote. Texas sends a number of people to the military. They're sent out of state, overseas, and the military does a poor job of informing them that they are still allowed to vote back home in Texas. Long residence requirement used to be that you had to live in Texas for a year before you were considered a resident. You couldn't vote until then. Property ownership. You had to have property, you had to own property to vote. Once again, this is going to disenfranchise minorities and poor Anglo Texans. We had annual registration and early registration. You actually had to register to vote every year usually around January, and this is when you had to pay your poll tax. So the annual registration, the early registration, that discouraged Texans from voting. Socioeconomic factors, socioeconomic factors, I'm sorry. Socioeconomic factors. <clears throat> Education, wealth, these kind of things. These are going to encourage or discourage you from voting. If you are poor, if you are working multiple jobs, you find that you don't have time to vote. If you're given a choice between going to work to earn money to put food on the table or going to vote, most of us are going to decide we need to go work. That's more important. Ballot length. But you don't realize it if you live in the major counties, if you live in the, the urban areas of Texas, our ballots are horrendously long. There's years I remember that we go in to vote and all of the races and everything we're voting on, the ballot would be 14 pages long. Do you want to sit there and look through 14 pages and decide who you want to vote for, click through every race? No, nobody wants to do that. So a lot of people would say, you know what, this is going to take too much of my time. I'm not going to go vote. Last, and I'm not going to go over it again because we've already talked about it, but political culture, the set of political values and beliefs that are dominant in the society, this was from our first lecture video. I talked about Texas being traditionalistic and individualistic. So this is talking about the voters in Texas. So now you should be able to tell me who is eligible to vote in Texas, who is ineligible, who cannot vote in Texas. Do we vote? That one is easy. The answer is no. Now I want to start talking about elections. We have 
different names or different types of elections in politics. The first is something called a primary election. Primaries, these primary elections, these are just devices for selecting political party nominees, for deciding who is going to represent the Republican Party or the Democratic Party as they run for that elected position. Now, we didn't always have primaries. We, the people, didn't always have a choice. If we look through history, historical types, used to be there was a caucus. The party elite would meet and they would say, hey, John Doe over there. I think they would make a great candidate and they'd go say, hey, John Doe, you're running for, for office. You're going to represent us. Well, what if we didn't like John, John Doe? We didn't have a choice. It was a take it or leave it attitude. Well, we go from the caucus to a party convention system. It expands the number of people participating, but it's still not everybody. So the party convention, we're still going to follow the party elite, but a handful of us are going to have a say. We're going to be able to influence. What if we don't like who they picked? We're out of luck once again. Well, this leads us to something called direct. This direct primary is everybody, you and I, all the voters, we get to vote for the person that we want to represent the party running for this office. So with this direct primary, we are actually getting a say in who gets to run for office. Refresher, please remember, 1944, primaries were recognized as an integral part of the election process. What court case was that? That was a test question. So we've got to have these primary elections, but who must hold a primary? It's held by parties. These parties that receive 20% of the gubernatorial vote, these parties that received 20% of the vote in the governor's election, in the, of the governor's race in the last election, are required to hold a primary. Who does this mean has to hold a primary? Which parties do we know are going to receive at least 20% of the vote in the governor's race? We know the two main parties are Republicans, Democrats. Well, does this mean third parties, independents or libertarians or other parties, the Green Party, can't run? No, this isn't what it means but they have a different method. They must do something else to get on our to get on the Texas ballot. They must hold these third parties must hold a convention. It's not going to be that easy. In addition to holding a convention, these third parties, these alternate parties must also file a list of supporters equal to 1% of total gubernatorial votes in the last election. Okay, English. What this means is that these third party people who want to run for office, they're going to ask you to sign a petition stating that you want them on the ballot for whatever position they want to run for. Governor, Lieutenant Governor, whatever. They're going to ask you to sign this ballot. It must equal 1%, the total gubernatorial vote. Once again, I like numbers that end in zero. It's easy. So if there were 500,000 votes cast in the last governor's election, they would need 1% of that and that number of signatures. 
So they would need 5,000 signatures telling the state of Texas to put you on the ballot. It's going to get a little bit worse. It's still not that easy because, you know, this isn't easy anyway, but we're going to make it worse. The supporters, the people who sign your petition, they must be registered voters, but they did not participate in a party primary. They did not participate in the Republican primary. They did not participate in the Democratic primary. Now, once they sign your, your petition, before it's turned into the Secretary of State for review, each page of signatures must be notarized. What happens if that page isn't notarized? All the signatures on that page are thrown out. They are null and void. It does not count. To run for office, to get on the Texas ballot, cost money. Is it expensive? For an elected position, if you want to run for office, you know you're going to need money, so I would say no, it's not. But I do want you to look at these, you know, see which ones are the most expensive. U.S. Senator, by far and away, this is going to be the most prestigious job, so it's going to cost the most money. $5,000 fee, you pay to the state of Texas, they put you on the ballot. U.S. Representative, so a U.S. House member, $3,125. Texas Statewide Officers, the Executive Branch, $3,750. State Senator, $1,250. State Rep, $750, etc., etc. So, know the cost for the first couple of them. It's a copy of a ballot. We're not even going to go over that. thought I took that out. I apologize. Primary elections. Since 1971, primaries have been funded. They have been paid for the state, paid for by the state, state treasury. Now, <clears throat> well, the primary election is held in Tuesday in Texas on the second Tuesday of March. This day is called Super Tuesday, and this is a reference to presidential election years when a number of states are holding their primary the second Tuesday of, of March. So that's why that particular day is referred to as Super Tuesday. We see turnout in primaries, primary elections, are much lower than in general elections. As bad as those number were from the general, the primaries are much, much worse. For you to win your primary election, you have to get a majority of the vote. It must be won by 50% plus one vote. Now, the primary election is run by the parties. These are, these are party primaries. So Republicans are having their own primary elections. Democrats are having their own primary elections, both on the same day. How many people can run in the primary election? How many people can say, I want to represent the Republican Party and running for U.S. Senator? How many people can say, I want to represent the Democratic Party running for the position of U.S. Senator. It's, un, it's unlimited. There is no set number. If you're lucky, it's only one, two. Usually it's going to be multiple people. But what happens if you have more than two? You're not guaranteed to get a majority. If you don't get a majority in this primary election in, in March, we go to something called a runoff election. So the runoff occurs if no single candidate receives a majority of the vote. We're going to take the top two candidates with the most votes, so the top two vote-getters, 
they're moving on to the next round. They're moving on to this runoff election. It takes place in May. And once again, this is going to be won by a simple majority. Now, with only two people running, is it possible to get a tie? Yes. Is it statistically possible to get a tie? No. With two people running, we are almost 100% guaranteed to have a majority winner. We've been talking about primary elections, and I want to continue, but something else. We see that there are different types of primaries throughout the United States. Two types we're going to focus on. Closed. A closed primary is simply you must be a registered member of that party to vote in the party's primary. So you must be, if it's a closed primary, you must be a registered Democrat to vote in that primary, the, the, the Democratic primary, or you must be a registered Republican to vote in the Republican primary. Then the other type, if one is closed, one is open simply means you can vote in any party's primary. You do not have to be a registered member of that party. Now, Texas, Texas, we're technically closed. Technically. Here's the catch. If you go to vote in a party primary in Texas in March, you do not have to be a registered member of that party. You can be, you know, you can go vote in the Democrats' primary. You can go vote in the Republicans' primary. It does not matter. However, what does matter, this is important, you cannot vote in more than one primary on election day. So if you go vote in the Democratic primary, you cannot go vote in the Republican primary. This is illegal. Texas will frown upon this. You can be charged with a criminal violation. Well, what if you vote in the Republican primary and somehow or another the Republican wins? They got a majority of the vote, but the Democratic in the Democratic primary election they have a runoff. You still cannot switch parties during a runoff. That counts as you voting in two in two party primaries because in the regular primary you voted Republican and the, the runoff you voted Democrat. This is illegal. So you cannot switch parties during a runoff. Now because Texas, well, we're technically closed, but not really, and, and in open primaries, we see something called crossover voting. Crossover voting is, hey, I'm a Republican. I plan to vote for the Republican candidate in the November general election, but I'm going to go vote for the Democrat in the primary election. I'm going to go vote for the Democrat in March. Why would we do this? Why would we have this crossover or this cross-party voting? It's simple. If you're a Republican going to vote for the Democrat, are you going to vote for the best Democratic candidate or are you going to vote for the worst? You're going to go vote for the worst. How come? Well, if the worst Democratic candidate wins the primary, this means that you have the worst Democratic candidate running against your Republican candidate and that should make it easier for your Republican candidate to win. Crossover voting, is it legal? Yes, it is. Now, general elections. We've gone through primary. 
Remember, this is at the state level, but this is also going to apply to federal government, but this is general elections or for, for state offices. They are administered by state and county governments. They run these elections. These general elections, we don't need a majority vote. We win by plurality, whoever gets the most. These general elections, they're held on the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November and even numbered years. And remember, our state elections, our state officers, held on non-presidential election years are held during the midterm elections. Sometimes things happen. People are removed from office, they resign, they pass on something. This can lead to special elections. Special elections are designed to meet special or emergency needs. These elections, nonpartisan, means there is no party involved. There is no primary. You don't have to win your party primary because there is no party involved. So everybody is just running on one ballot. To win, you must receive a majority, 50% of the vote. What happens if you don't, if nobody gets a majority? Well, guess what? We're having a special runoff election. Yeah. The conduct and administration of elections. The Secretary of State is the Chief Elections Officer. Remember, that is their main job is to administer election law. We have a Board of Elections. Their job is to arrange polling places printing of ballots. Printing of ballots is actually an important issue. If we have people running for office, if we have names we don't recognize, we tend to vote for the first name, the name on top. So they will randomly assign names. They will not put them in alphabetical order that would give an unfair advantage to whoever's name came up first. Something we don't think about, but we do. The county commissioner's court, they'll draw districts. Tell us where we're going to go vote. They'll appoint election judges. These election judges, are, they stay at the poll polling location all day. And they make sure that election law is followed. They'll rent the voting devices, whether it be electronic, whether it be a paper ballot. However we're going to vote, they're in charge of getting these devices. There is something out there called straight ticket voting. Let me add, as of... August of 2019, Texas actually did away with this option of straight ticket voting. What occurs in straight ticket voting is you are voting for one party in all the races in which they're running. What I mean by this is that you would go to cast your ballot you would look at it, one of the first questions is, do you want a straight ticket vote Republican Party? Do you want a straight ticket vote Democratic Party? If you said yes, this means that in every race that a Democrat was running, 
straight ticket, Democratic voting, you're, you've automatically voted for that person. You don't even have to see that race if it's an electronic voting machine. Same thing for Republican. Now, when it came to elections, it used to be we had paper ballots. They give us like this book, and they'd give us this paper ballot, and we'd go put it on this machine, and we would punch out little chads, little holes. This indicated who he wanted to vote for. Well, now we're going high tech. We're going electronic. These electronic voting machines. We see that electronic combines the best of both worlds. What I mean by this is that the candidates are listed under the office. It is very easy to see who is running for what position. And they gave us the option for straight ticket voting. That was the second or third question on these, on these ballots on the electric voting. Do you want a straight ticket vote? You said yes. You said no. Move on about your business. Who gets elected? This should be a review. Traditionally, in statewide elections, candidates who win are typically WASP, the white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, male. How do we know males of gender? We've only had two female governors. Who were they? You need to know you need to know those for a test question in the past. We also see we also know this because if we look over the elected officers and the elected offices in Texas history, we see that we've elected very few women very few minorities to statewide offices. For our general election campaign, for our November campaign, party identification matters. Remember, we talked about this. What party do you want to be to win an office, a statewide office in Texas? It's not required, but it helps immensely. That's right, Republican. Republicans in Texas are more likely to win. Incumbency matters. An incumbent is the current office holder. They are already in that position. They've already won that elected office. We see that an incumbent has certain advantages. One is name recognition. We may not know, well, let me, let me start from a different angle. As we're going into voting season, we're seeing commercials for governor, lieutenant governor, you know, attorney general, and it's, hi, I'm governor so-and-so. Hi, I'm lieutenant governor so-and-so. Now, we may not be able to tell you anything that they have done, anything that they have accomplished, but thanks to these commercials, we know that they are the incumbent. We know that they have already been elected to this position. So we go into the voting booth, and we see incumbent Governor Greg Abbott, Republican Governor Greg Abbott, versus Democratic candidate Joe Blow. Now we don't necessarily, we don't have to know anything about either one. So how do we decide who we're going to vote for? If we don't know this incumbency matters, this advantage, we're going to look, we're going to see, say, well, I know Governor Abbott's the incumbent governor. My life is going pretty good. Nothing's bad has happened, so he must be doing a decent job. I'm going to vote for him. Suddenly he's got a vote and he didn't have to do anything. The second advantage in, in incumbency is money matters, or money, 
raising funds, raising money. These interest groups, are they going to donate money to the incumbent or are they going to donate money to the challenger? They're going to donate money to the, the incumbent. Why? Well, if you've been in office for a while, we have a working relationship. We know what we are getting for our money. Yeah, the challenger may say, oh, yeah, I'll back you up. Oh, yeah, I'll do this for you. But we don't know for sure. So we're going to see that interest groups, businesses, whoever, they're going to donate most of their money to the incumbent. And what have I been telling you you need to, you need more than anything else to get elected? Money. Mobilization of groups, no. Choosing issues. During the general election campaign, as you're, you have won your, pri your party primary and you're moving to November. Now, remember, these are two totally different types of elections. These are two totally different audiences. In the party primary, you are only trying to appeal to members of your party. So you're going to try to prove that you are the most Republican out of the Republicans. You're going to try to prove you're the most Democrat out of the Democrats. But once you win that party primary and you go to the general election, now you're trying to attract your party. You're trying to attract Republicans, for example. But you're also trying to attract Democrats and you're trying to attract independents. So we're going to see you become more moderate, more middle of the road. So when you choose your issues, you want to choose issues to discuss that aren't as divisive, that aren't going to aggravate people, that are safe for you to talk about. Last couple of things. Campaigning. <clears throat> There's two aspects to campaigning. The first is stumping. Stumping, you go out on the campaign trail and you give your stump speech. You tell the people, I'm great, yada, yada, yada. This is what I want to do. This is why I'm going to benefit Texas. This is how it's going to help Texas. Now, the second aspect, and this one's a little harder to deal with, is called negative campaigning or mudslinging. Now, in mudslinging, we are not saying positive things about us and our plans. We are saying negative things about our opponent. We're not talking about how good we are. We are talking about how bad they are. Is there anything wrong with this? No, you can sit here and talk about why you are a better selection. However, the issue becomes you have to be very, very careful. Because, say, on day one, you say the negative, this negative thing about your opponent. Day two, you say this negative thing about your opponent. Day three, day four, day five. Day six, you're saying the same negative thing about your opponent, but this is all your supporters are hearing from you, and sooner or later, your supporters are going to start thinking, you know what, all I'm hearing is this negative information. All I'm hearing is you be a jerk about this other candidate. Pretty soon, you're mudslinging, this name-calling, this negative campaigning, is going to turn off your supporters. Pretty soon, you're going to make them sympathetic to your opponent. Why do you have to be careful with negative campaigning, with mudslinging? Because you don't know when that date is. It might be day three. It might be day 15. You don't know. So you've got to be very, very careful if you're going to be bad-mouthing your, your election opponent.